right, so it's um, 6.32, so let's call this meeting to order. Um, today we're going to talk about the budget and the information meeting. Um, as sort of our, our clear objectives, um, is there someone who's willing to be a evaluator for this meeting? Mm -hmm. what? The forms, oh, shoot. Forms of the email forms. Rich, could you grab that big one? Yeah. Thank you. Is there someone who's willing to be the evaluator? Thanks, Sam. Do we want to welcome public to come to see our meeting? Is there anything in particular anyone would like to comment at this time before we get started? Okay. Um, is there someone here to represent Kat Ernst? Um, she requested to be on the uh, agenda this month. <coughs> Hearing none, we will move on. Um, that was, is that who was here last month? Yes, mm -hmm. yep, about the bus stop issue yep. in Braintree. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so she requested in writing, and so that's why she was on the agenda this month. Yeah, that's for you. Okay, uh, next is we need to set the date for the budget informational meeting by statute. It needs to be a certain number of days before town meeting and the vote. Um, ten days, Laura. Ten, ten days. days. So it's necessarily during school vacation, which is always unfortunate. Uh, Lane, was there a certain day you wanted to hold that budget informational meeting? Uh, yeah, the 24th, which is Monday, the 28th, which is Friday, are both bad. Um, 24th is the actual board pre-meeting uh, uh -huh. anyway, and then the 28th, I'm off um, at a class that I'm taking to help kind of overhaul the evaluation system for the teachers um, in the district. So 25th, 26th, or 27th, and Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, any of those days are wide open for me, um, whatever is most comfortable. Do we comfortable. usually hold it on a Wednesday, do you know? I can't remember from the past. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it seems like Wednesdays generally. I'm going to be out of town those days. That week. <clears throat> yeah, it's school vacation, which is always a yeah. hassle. Um, I don't expect there's going to be a lot of folks. I've had five community forums, four community forums on right. budget, so typically we might get one or two. But. We typically hold it in the high school. Um, so Brian's going to be away that week. How does Wednesday look for everyone else? Does that look doable? So that would be Wednesday the 26th. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we set, set it for that? Six or 6.30, either way. I, I'm not going to be there. Let's do 6.30. Okay, 6.30. And I'll do it at the high school. Yes. Yeah, first time for people to get home and eat. So that's the 26th at 6.30. We're just at yes, the yeah. Media Center. Thank you. Um, we also have a the day before town meeting, correct? Um, <coughs> Monday is also a, a meeting. Do you know the time of that? It's usually held usually, in the um, It's usually in the, uh, the auditorium. auditorium. It's usually 6.30 as well. Okay. Yeah. And so, actually it's going to be in the Media Center because they have a play going on. Okay. So we're going to be in the media center. So for the that is meeting. another school board sort of. And that's at six. That's that Monday, six March second. Yeah. Yeah, it's always the evening before the vote. Yep. So, well, that's what's worn done here. I mean, I six suppose PM, you, you can said. change it okay. if no, you guys, but it's always been at six. Yep. So what's what's the dates again? I'm sorry. Uh, Wednesday, February twenty sixth, <clears throat> at the high school in the media center at six thirty. That's the budget informational meeting. And the um, sort of a discussion of the budget. I forget what they call it—a reorganization of the the annual meeting. Yeah, yeah. Annual it will town be meeting. What's on this this morning? Right. The first uh, four or five articles. And so that's on Monday, March second, <clears throat> at six. That's the draft. 
I don't know if that will get approved tonight. But okay, thank that you. That will also take place at the Media Center at RUHS. Uh, Kat, I see you arrived. Do you want to, do you, we, yes. we've. Um, my husband is on the phone because in the last session um, I was called with my advice because I think he's not appreciated. Okay. Um, you are on the agenda. We, um, we have time for you right now if you want to present your complaint. Typically with a board presentation is how it works, is you present what your concerns are. The board asks me to present, they ask both of us questions, they make a decision. Yeah. Um, otherwise, what we end up doing is if I'm passing them information prior to, I can be shading them. So we just want to make sure that everything is fair and appropriate. So we have seen your emails. But, but I do really have it all here for anybody who wants to peruse What it. we need to hear from you is, is the concern. And, you know, we're not going to debate he said, she said sort of thing. Just, you know, why are you here? What concerns <coughs> do you have? Um, I'm raising that I'm here because I've been trying to secure a blessing for my children. We live off of Bernstein, although the bus used to pass by our street. I don't expect the bus to go onto a private street. That is not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for an old bus stop to be reactive so that my children have access to schools. section to go to the defunct bus stop that I'm asking to be established would take them an extra one and a half to two minutes. So it's not an imposition. They said that they will not be able to change that until they find out if the board is willing to consider reinstating that bus stop. And that is all in the minutes of the meeting that I was at with the, super, with the um, town board, select board. Is there anything else you want to add? You have all the information in front of you. I don't know what else I can add. Basically, it's, I just want to make sure my kids make school home every day to and from school. And there's another family that lives up there as well that is more than willing to utilize that bus stop, so it's not just my, my children, but my children are young and they're gonna be in the school system for over 10 years, and I want to make sure that they have adequate bus stops. Okay. So I can kind of talk through the process that was done in making the decision. I'll also talk through a little bit about what the board policy is, what the state law is. Um, but this map actually has been in existence since October um, when the first kind of request came in to consider a new bus stop, a new bus route for the buses that go up and around um, where Mrs. Arntz lives. This is Flint Hill. Um, this is Braintree Hill Road. This is Bent Hill Road that goes down by uh, Braintree Elementary School. Currently there are two bus routes. Um, there is one that comes up Flint, which I'm actually surprised it can get up that hill in the winter time. And then it turns here, goes down Braintree Hill uh, to Route 12A. There is another bus that comes in here on Thresher Road and then it turns down um, Bent Hill Road um, and goes down towards the elementary school. Um, Cat is up here, um, and when the request came in, the first thing that happened was the transportation director went out there um, in a van and took a look at all the routes to see what was possible, um, came back and reported that it just it was not a safe route for the buses. He talked about the need for turnarounds, buses backing up. Um, and I said, okay, well, it's appropriate for me to go out and take a look as well. And so I had two specific questions for him. Um, and the two that I had were here. In here. So this is Rolling Rock. Um, and we talked about it and then we went up and took a look at things. Now, what would have to happen um, if we put a bus stop here is if the bus from Thresher came this way, 
um, right? It's going to have to stop at the stop. It's going to have to back up Rolling Rock Road, which is cantered downwards. The backup is easy enough. The problem is right here, it cannot make the turn to do the turnaround. In addition to that, this stretch through here, there's an area where there's a very long downhill and a very long uphill that is very steep and very, very narrow that a car would not be able to get past a bus on right. um, if they met. I think that that should be addressed with the select board because that is not Can I finish my presentation because I did talk to the select board? Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons that I think things got a little testy last time was because we were interrupting each other, so I think it'll be easier. And then if you want to ask questions of me, you can grill me as much as you want once I get done. Um, so, again, so this was incredibly narrow. Um, coming from this direction, right, if you came here, right, the problem is you can't do the back end to make the turnaround. There just isn't enough space here. That's why those areas are shaded. We also looked here and said, okay, if the bus is coming up the road and comes this way and they do a pickup here, the bus has literally got to go past. It's got to back all the way up, and then it's got to turn come back down. Same thing is true if it goes this way. It's got to back up, turn, and go this way to go all the way back down. It's horrible to have these buses backing up, especially for this distance. And with cars that are coming, it's just, it's not safe to do. Um, we did take a look at a, a couple of other things. Um, I spoke directly with Megan O'Toole. Let me throw this up here. Talk to who I spoke with as well as the road foreman. Um, and both Danny and I actually spoke with them independently. And they both gave us the same assessment. Right? Both of us looked. We drove the roads. We spoke with Megan O'Toole. We talked. She's from the Braintree Select Board. We spoke with Jeff Masterson, Braintree Road, for road Foreman. Um, and as well as our own bus drivers. And a couple of things that they said is, one, there has not been a bus route up there in their memory. And their memory goes back to 20 to 30 years. So that's checking with our own bus drivers, and that's checking with Jeff Masterson himself. Set it in front of his, his select board chair in my office. When may I do this? Uh, when I'm done. And then you can ask the questions that you want. Um, he also reiterated when we met in my office that that stretch of road is the last that is done on their routes. And he could not guarantee, even if it was safe for the buses to travel up there in the wintertime, he could not guarantee that he could have it done in a timely manner for pickup and drop off. And he said that in front of me and in front of Megan O'Toole. He also told Danny that. Um, in terms of our board policy, it's this. Daily transportation of district's pupils is a privilege. School buses will not operate on roads deemed by the transportation supervisor to be hazardous or unsafe for buses. Um, in the case of a request by parents to add additional routes, the decision whether or not to do so will be made by the superintendent in consultation with the transportation supervisor. So at my level, the request should have stopped. Um, but you're here in front of the board, and I'm happy to have them consider the request. But it is not safe to put buses up through there. Um, it looked unsafe when I was driving it in the summertime. Again, the bus is 40 feet long. It weighs 14,000 pounds without kids. It, um, but in the wintertime, you know, it's the potential for things to be catastrophic. personally to the bus driver that went along with you on that route was the gentleman there are two buses that go to the branch of school. Um, the, I spoke to both of the bus drivers. The female is the bus driver that goes up Thresher down Vet Hill. The male is the bus driver that comes up um, Flint and goes down Branch Hill. Um, what he said was that he did do that drive through. He could not turn around at Summit Road and I said I wasn't expecting that. He said he could definitely make the turn around at Rolling Rock Road or at the intersection where the church is located, which is that triangle there. He said that has been done before and it's not a problem. That is what he quoted to me. Um, <coughs> the, inter the bus stop at Rolling Rock Road, if they would like to check something in writing versus their memory, they will find out because it was stated at the select board meeting by a couple of members of the select board who actually used that bus stop. So I don't understand how their memory can go back 40 years 
if per se that bus stop was actually in effect, which it was, they're either forgetting something or they're really just not telling you the truth. And that's a possibility as well. The, the, the truth is, is irrelevant. What matters in this conversation is, is it safe? It exactly. is not safe. That particular road is one of the safest roads. It is a wide, flat stretch of road. Extremely wide, extremely flat. The bus roads that go up bent and come up Thresher and come up Flint are much worse. They are much steeper grade. There's absolutely zero reason why that can't happen. I don't understand who did this survey, but I believe that if they did do the survey in, in earnest, this is what they say, I would like to see it in writing because I'd like to argue that because that is ridiculous. Kat, the, ar the argument, like I said, it stops here um, with whatever the yeah, board decision. It should have it should have stopped year. with me. I spent a good twenty hours with Dan looking. You can you not interrupt me? The argument please? should have stopped with you. I am going over your head apparently because I do not like the way I was dealt with by you. Okay, so um, are there any questions that any board members have for either Kat or for Lynn? Do we have a copy of the minutes from the select board? That I was not a member of the select board okay. meeting. I can't confirm or deny what's been said. Do you have a copy? I don't have them okay. with me. I wasn't told that. I've, I've looked them up online, and, also and there is no <coughs> conclusions or anything. There's just simply that you came and presented. There wasn't any conclusions. What, what I actually asked um, the, the select board, Megan, when she was there, those shaded areas on the map around Rolling Rock, I said, you know, it, it could be possible if folks were willing to cut down a few trees and, and build the area up a little bit for the bus. So it, we were doing everything we could to try to make this happen. That particular area has actually been widened in the past five years quite a bit. I have a question. You know, we don't guarantee transportation. There's many um, places for instance, in Brookfield, where I live, where the bus is not provided. For instance, in West Brookfield, um, parents have to transport their kids to Route 12 for a bus pickup there. Um, so we don't guarantee bus transportation. I'm at wondering whether, you know, what happened last year with your kids. And the problem being is that I obviously need to get a job, and I can't do that if I'm required to drive. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know when, when and if there was a bus um, stop there, but I do know that um, several years ago we had the same question in Brookfield, and it was decided not to add more bus travel just because of the expense. People bought their houses where they bought their houses knowing that, you know, the precedent there had not been. Um, It's not going to take more than an extra two minutes maximum, which I was told by the road board and Jess, that it would take an extra two minutes for that particular driver, Charles, to come up and do his Flint and Branch Hill Road, come a little bit further, and be able to do the stretch that goes up and turns around Road Rock. Okay. Is there any other new information that needs to be presented to us tonight? And we will. from the board have any further questions or that they want to voice now? There are two buses that go to the Grange Tree School, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What about the kids on, like, um, further over in East Grange Tree? Does the bus run over there? I'd I mean, have to like, pull like, the actual route. Like, like beyond Path, like, Farnham, is it Farnham Brook over there? Or, yeah. It's, it's on Menard there. Road. And is it, does the bus go over there? It's going to be something that comes up to East Grange Tree. Because it seems like the problem is the, the bus doesn't come across the hill. There's kind of like two separate loops, but but no loop that comes through there and no way to pull the loop through across the hill is what it seems like. Because if the bus didn't, if the bus just had to stop and then could keep going, I mean, you just have to change, you'd have well, to no, completely there, alter the bus routes. Like I said, the the part, part of the problem also on the left-hand side between Rolling Rock and Thresher, that turn, 
there is a very long stretch, and you know, I invite folks to go and drive it themselves. Of course, I did it in the summertime, so it's probably going to look worse now. Um, it's a long downhill, it's a long uphill, and it's narrow. Mm -hmm. And the narrow is the problem. Um, mm -hmm. um, to, to, to Kat's point, I'm, I'm actually surprised when I drive up Ben Hill that the buses can make it up Ben Hill, and I'm surprised they can make it up Flint Hill. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Um, if there's no objection, I think this is something we should talk about later and review different documentation and see what mm -hmm. we decide. And how will we let how will we let her know what we decided? Um, you can usually you can do it in writing, um, okay. the board chair, or at another meeting. It also sounds like this is a this is something that we've delegated to our superintendent to decide. So I don't right. know that it's our decision. Yeah, it's not our Policy decision. Policy-wise, it's not. But no, I mean, well, it's our decision to make sure that he is treated for fairly. Exactly. And that, so we I mean, do need to look at the, at the argument, but ultimately, he as long as he's following policies, policies, we and, can't change the policy. Yeah. So that's yeah. also something that you should know. Is that as long as he's not. In, in matters of busing, um, it can be for what they call administrative action. So that's like if um, we have a bus route and a child, let's say, gets on trouble on the bus, and the principal says, no, no, you know, you can't ride the bus anymore, um, and then it gets appealed to the superintendent, and the superintendent says, no, no, you can't ride the bus anymore, that could be appealed to the board. That's an administrative action. Um, but they're very clear in terms of bus routes. Um, yeah, and that was taken into complete consideration, and Steve Kenny was spoken to as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, and we will let you know in writing what we decide. Mm -hmm. um, my children will be in school for 10 years. I anticipate that they will be prepared to continue to see you guys every single year, every single month if necessary. It's not fair, in my opinion, and my husband's opinion, and every parent that I've spoken with that an old bus stop cannot be reinstated. And if you'd like to get documentation of where that bus stop was and the dates that it was used, I'd be more than happy to get that for you. I just wasn't going to leave that at this time. Next on our agenda is um, a discussion of the school calendar. This was also brought up at the Braintree meeting last month and um, Lane is going to present a little bit to us about how that calendar is devised and some of the, the rules we can and can't use to amend it. So in terms of the, the, the calendar, there's rules that come <coughs> from two sources. Um, there's rules that come from state law. There's also um, rules that are embedded in our, our CBA, our, our contract with the union. Um, in terms of the state, we've got to run school for a minimum of 180 days. 175 of those days have to be student days, days that the kids are here, um, that we're in the process of educating them. Um, those do not, you know, in-service days don't count towards that 175. Um, we have to have at least five teacher in-service days um, by state law, so five full days that the teachers are, are here um, being provided with professional development and professional development time. Um, in our case, um, our calendar is a little bit special um, because it controls all the sending districts um, that send their students to the technical center. Um, so usually we start up in October, um, I start talking with the cabinet about it, about what fits our needs for the professional development plan that we have for the coming year. Um, they kind of hammer out where they would like to see the days fall um, to be able to deliver that professional development um, to the teachers. And then after that, I go and I actually talk with the superintendents from the other district. And you know, there's some wiggling and jiggling just to make sure that everything fits everybody's needs as best as it can. But um, it's got to be decided in, in full by April 1st. Um, in terms of the CBA, um, there are a couple of uh, additions there. Um, the teachers can be here for a maximum of 185 days. 
um, they may not start. Um, you know, one of the questions that, that came up um, was, you know, why can't we front load the, the professional development days um, by one of the community members? And the reason is because under the contract, we are not allowed to start the teachers more than two days before the students arrive for that first day. Um, and in addition to that, both of those days aren't technically PD. Um, one of those days is for the teachers to work in their classroom and get prepared um, for the next day. Um, 179 days based on our contract are student days. Um, two of those are what we call contingency days. And we kind of talked a little bit about this last year in negotiations. In other words, the first two snow days of every year, um, even though you know, the teachers can be here for 185 days max, um, because of how it's written in the contract, they do not have to make them up. Um, so that's what the contingency means. And then under our contract, they have to have six um, full days of in-service as opposed to the five. One of those days being the, you know, an agreement that they, is that, that day that they work with the kids. Um, right, so in-service days in general, uh, there's six full days are required by our contract, one day is for the teachers. Um, one of the reasons that we are providing the professional development on these PD days while the teachers are here and in session, um, it's, it's part of it has to do with cost. Um, an in-service day, if we were going to have just the teachers here and pay them additional to come in for an, an additional day so that we didn't have to have a half day for the kids to do it, um, it's $40,000 a day just for the teachers to be here on that day. And that does not include the cost of the trainer or the training that goes on. If we were to have the entire district here, if we had the support staff and everyone else in to be trained on a day that's outside of the contract, the cost would be closer to $70,000 a day. Um, so one of the reasons that we use the days the way that we do is to control that cost. Um, one of the reasons that we use the half days is because they kind of allow us to do two things. As long as the students are here for half a day, as far as the state is concerned, it counts towards their full days of school, that full day, 175 day count. So it allows us to get a, a full day count in as far as the AOE is concerned, and it allows us to do a half day of training. And lots of times we try to put the trainings on the, the Tuesdays or Wednesdays, uh, depending upon which part of the district the training is for, because those are typically the days that the teachers um, stay late under the contract anyway. So, you know, they'll start at noon and they won't get out until, you know, 3.45 to 4.15. <coughs> Um, so just parts and pieces. I can throw you up there with, uh, unless there's questions on that, what the calendar kind of looks like for next year. Um, this has not been in front of the superintendents yet. Um, the next meeting that we have next month, the superintendents will be talking about it. So August, um, you see the blue days, those are the full day in-service days. The green days with the slash through it, those are the half days. Um, we talked a lot about the need uh, within the district to have a professional development line. You know, we talked a little bit about, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a curriculum director? But, you know, if we don't have that, then one of the things that we really need is a professional development line so that we can start going after providing training to the teachers that they need to get us where we want to go on behalf of the kids. We talked about, you know, building a science uh, curriculum at the elementary school. We talked about revamping the core curriculum at the high school, which is the science, the ELA, and the math. We talked about bringing in a facilitator next year if the budget goes through to be able to provide um, some social-emotional um, teaching for the teachers so that they can interact in a more positive way with the students um, when minor things happen. Um, so there's a whole plethora of things that we have planned for next year. And the way that that is reflected in the calendar is you're going to see that those full days, the blue days, they're all up front in the first three months. That's time for the facilitators to come in and actually interact with the teachers and do the bulk of the training. And then the green half days are there to do the follow-up. You know, are you using it? Okay, we've got the curriculum, um, the curriculum documents revamped. People are using it. Now on these half days, um, it's time to start taking a look at the assessment tools that we put into place last year. What is the data that's coming from them and how the facilitators train those teams, especially at the high school, how to sit down, how to analyze that data. Um, learn those skills to be able to carry on those meetings themselves within a department and then to be able to go through a process to do some brainstorming and some problem solving. Oh, you know, the data's showing us that on these four standards every year, the kids are really struggling. Um, as a department with our own knowledge, 
you know, what are we going to do differently when we teach the students these, these concepts next year? So it's really trying to get that model in place. So the, the calendar that we've built for next year, again, assuming it passed muster with, um, with, uh, with Bruce and Suzette, the other two superintendents that are involved here, um, this is why we structured it the way we did and um, why those PD days are in there. Um, so questions, thoughts? I think we still end up with a lot of broken weeks in the first. We up do. Until, up and until the end of December. Yeah. Like we have more broken weeks than we have full weeks. We do. It's more speaking as a parent than a <coughs> board member. I found the half days doesn't amount to a lot of education for the students that are there. You know, we're talking about, you know, they want to have the training, but I know my son, there's on a lot of the half days, they'll watch a movie. And one of them was Jurassic Park, so I'm not sure what <laughs> educational value that was. But it's it seems like every half day they don't get a lot of instruction. So you know, would it be better to combine those and give the kids the whole day off and let the teachers have the full day of um, development? So the, the then you extend our calendar, right? Extend your calendar, and then you you owe me seventy thousand dollars to bring everybody in for that additional day. And that's if they agree to it, because the contract spells out very specifically how many days are there. Um, the half-day piece, I'm in, I am in agreement with you. Um, this professional development, the amount that we have those days, was not intended to be always as much. Um, the six days have to be there. The half days, as things get into place, they were built as a structure to get things into place, to get things up and running the way we want them, and then we can pull back on them. Now, the other piece to talk a little bit about with the half days right now, the other way to think about them is kind of turn it around a little bit. There is a much greater, there's going to be a much greater impact um, because of the PD than anything that they lose over those half days. Because right? right now, and, and again, this is not a, a criticism of the teachers, and I can't, can't say that enough. This is not criticizing the teachers. This is... This is the district has not provided the structures to the teachers over time in terms of curriculum and PD to get things where we, we, we want them to, to be in terms of outcomes for kids. Uh, but we've got to provide the time. There are alternative structures if folks in the community is willing to you know, add some days and, and you know, during negotiations we can do that, we can, but it's, it's about 70000 a day to do. Um, just to, to put a, a perspective on What it. are other districts doing for They all that, have half days kind of, once a month. Okay. Yeah, that's that's um, the norm. If you're I, think I, I think I looked at some calendars of the Chittenden <laughs> County Schools, and it looks like, and I don't know, because it looks like they have, like, every Monday, certain months, every Monday they start at 10 in the morning yeah. instead of, and so they just have that built in. Elementary. So it's really predictable for. Yeah for working families. Elementary schools are a little bit different um, the norm. So you can't, I can't say every district, um, but the norm across the country is that it's a half day a month, um, secondary level. At the elementary level, it's a half day either a week or it's a half day every other week. Um, that's the norm across the country because the teachers do need time. It's not just, that time isn't just to um, sit down and, and do the actual professional development, the training. Um, but it's once they've got the training, it's their time to sit down as a, a brain trust and a collective and put it to good use and talk mm -hmm. with each other. Um, build that camaraderie, get those professional learning communities going. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been out of the norm in terms of, um, you know, curriculum work and professional development for years. Um, so on the one hand, you know, either we can keep it in place for a couple of years and, and get stuff up to where we want to be. We can pull it out, but nobody can complain if we pull it out that things aren't moving forward. So have you considered like making it a more regular schedule, say, you mm -hmm. know, like every other Monday or, so, you know, some sort of regular schedule so that families do have, yeah. you know, more of a routine built in? The, ba the basic logic between, between the half days, and we've actually already cut back two that we used to have. Um, when they sat down, they were trying to prevent as, as many choppy weeks. Um, they didn't do quite as good a job of it this year as they did in previous years. But the other thing that they're always looking at is, is look, if we have to build in a partial day or whatnot, can't we put it so that it either extends a vacation or it's adjacent to a conference day? You'll see a lot of that in this mm -hmm. calendar um, so that, you know, the parents are getting a little bit more time at home. When yeah, I think this they're... calendar actually does that better than this current year's calendar. Yeah, yeah. So trying, trying, trying to make those connections for, for parents. So there, there is quite a bit of thought and logic that goes into it.
Is the conference day considered a student day or no? no. Y yes and no. One is, one's not, if I remember. Um, again, I have to go back and look at all my notes when I was pulling through it the first time. I literally have to sit down and look at the state laws, the contract, um, and then some of the, of the other agreements that are in there when I set up the calendar each year to make sure that I'm not, not screwing it up. Um, but they, they used to, the, the conference days, there was something that happened, and you two might be able to speak to it better than I did. You used to have two, and then there was some disagreement over, did it count for a conference day, did it not? And then I it's... to speak. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You have to count, according to this new calendar, you have to count the conference days as student days. And this year, the same the, thing, because otherwise they don't have 179 days. Yeah, so the contingency days are, are there. They just, we got to make sure that they happen. So, so they, That's what they're, they're talking about. considered student days. Yeah. But there was a, there was a agreement or at one point in time about whether the conference days in the past, five or six years ago, about whether they counted for in-service or not because there were two, and it sounded like right. in the end the agreement was okay because one side is saying both should count, the other side is saying none can count, the agreement was that one counts and the other does not. I was not privy to any of that. So yeah, so that's the, the, <laughs> the model, but that's what, that's what I heard when I was pull, pulling, pulling stuff together. So. so your expectation, Lane, is that, I and mean, right now it looks to me like we've got seven half days mm -hmm. and two conference days. Your expectations that we will in future years need fewer half days if we get the training done and we get things moving forward um, as we are we should need fewer again the norm norm is is one a month we're, we're at seven there's ten months in a school year um, you know I, th I think reasonably probably four to five would be reasonable and the expectation is that you know two years a year to get year, year of heavy training this year, a year to make sure that um, we're coming in, we're checking in, we're making sure that people are using what they've learned. Um, and that they're self-sufficient. You know, a lot of this, this work it isn't meant to be necessarily led by an administrator. Um, these are skills that groups of educated people just use, those professional learning communities, as long as they've been trained in it. They sit down, they examine their work with each other, they use some data to inform it, and then they make the decisions about you know, how they're going to proceed. Um, and those are, they need time to be able to do that. So, but my arguments um, for what they're worth. Any other discussion around this? And then, this is this decision. Yep. <laughs> so, I, right, we're responding in part to the questions last month. Mm -hmm. yep. Sounds like this is pretty routine. It's mm -hmm. happening in the, the other districts around the area, and it's, 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 we got to hold his feet to the fire. To, let's have some results. Let's have some results. If you don't have results, there's no reason to. Yeah. Right. So Hi. we're gonna do it. Let's have results. I have heard feedback as well from parents who feel like there's a lot of missed time, very long vacations, and these half days, um, you know, to follow up with what Brian has shared, I've heard from others who are concerned the value of that day for students. And I think that's something that needs to be strongly considered. Um, and I guess the feedback where I would be comfortable to be able to justify these half days to concerned parents taxpayers is to show the benefit coming from them. We'll, we'll talk about some of the benefits because there's been significant ones at the elementary um, which has been using it for that purpose for the last two years uh, when we get to the budget discussion piece. Um, uh, high school as we've kind of touched on before um, their main focus for the last two years was that mandate from the state about the you know the, the proficiency based grading and the, the, the graduation requirements. Um, which the state dropped on everybody, gave them no guidance on how to do, and so every district across the state was scrambling around for five years trying to figure out how to put it together. That's what they spent all their time doing. Uh, but they are in the position now, um, we're starting next year, that we've got those facilitators if the budget that goes through, um, we'll be coming in and doing this work with them. So that, that's the goal. What they used this time for previously was those, uh, the graduation requirements and the, 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 the standards based period. Yeah.
questions or comments? Okay. Um, thank you. So next we have a discussion of the budget. And we'll to present that. Um, so this, um, yeah, this, we've been, there's been five presentations now out and about. I'm not including the discussions at the board. Um, so unless people have specific questions on some of the pieces that are in here, it's not all the details. When we get to the actual numbers, it's just the, you know, this is the discretionary, this is the non-discretionary, um, because we've talked about the specifics so much over the last couple of, couple of meetings that it shouldn't be there. But typically, this budget presentation and the one that's done in front of um, folks for the annual report usually starts off with taking a look, a reminder of what the general vision is, and then kind of moves into, you know, how have we done? You know, what, what progress have we made towards that general vision? And then how is what we're planning for in the budget for next year designed to keep us moving in that direction? And so that's kind of what I'll talk a little bit about now. Um, don't want to necessarily read this for you, but there is, there is a big, broad general vision out there um, for the district uh, for the next decade, and all the parts and pieces in terms of your ends actually play into this and support this. So what we're trying to do um, is we're trying to revamp things uh, so that the schools are producing such positive outcomes for, for kids that we actually have parents that are moving into the three towns to take advantage of the quality education we provide. And there's a lot of reasons for doing this. Um, the big, biggest one outside of just what we're providing for the kids, because they're, they're, they're the primary reason we do what we do, but there's a tremendous amount of economic impacts um, that are positive that can come out of this. Um, the more people that we have living in the town, the more people the tax burden is spread over. The more people that are living in the town, the more likely it is for businesses to move into the town to support those people. And again, the tax burden is now spread over more entities. Um, it also, they tend as the, the quality of the schools go up, um, you have the opportunity for property values to rise. And then the other thing that would be kind of neat is if we get some businesses moving into town, we get more people here, um, is for this to be a flourishing area where the students, as they graduate, if they decide that they want to come and they want to live here, they can do it and they can make a high wage, would be the goal in the end of all this. But it all comes down to, to, to getting people moving in. And that's why you've probably heard me harp over the years about the, the importance of increasing enrollments. Um, as the enrollments increase, money starts to flow in and we can do more and more on behalf of kids. So, We've kind of been investing over the last two years, um, primarily at the, the elementary level. Um, but we've been in building programs kind of in two areas. We've been looking in the area of curriculum, um, what's taught, how it's taught, how we measure learning, right, so that the teachers have the information to adjust their instruction. So we've got that piece that's going on. And the perfect example at the elementary school is, is the revisions to the math program. Um, we made sure that at the K-3 level, um, they were using the Bridges curriculum that was brought in and worked out with, with UVM a few years back, that they were actually implementing it the way that it was supposed to. And then we did the adjustments that were needed in the Bridges curriculum in grades 4, 5, and 6, um, so that the teachers were, were using it properly and appropriately um, to be able to connect with kids. We also spent a year of offering two graduate courses that most of the elementary teachers took in mathematics, which were the uh, eight principles of, of math. Um, a lot of you have heard about the Common Core. Um, the Common Core really didn't change much about what's supposed to be taught to kids. What it changed was how it's taught. And so they had an opportunity to take two graduate courses right here taught by one of our own instructors who also teaches at Castleton State College to come in and learn those eight practices and put them into place. Um, so there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been going on. At the same time that you've got the work that is geared strictly towards academic improvements, you've had a lot of work that's been happening in terms of the social-emotional realm. Um, putting in programming to, to, to work with the students of trauma, um, to make sure that when they come in every day, they are open and ready for learning. 
uh, that their emotional disturbances that they're happening are not preventing them from being able to access what we're trying to do academically. Um, and so those two things um, have been going on at the elementary level. Um, some of that is also stretched out to the high school. There's actually been some social emotional programming supports that have gone in at the high school level as well as part of starting to build their structures up um, with a behavioral interventionist and the inclusion of an adjustment counselor um, to work with those students who act together as a team to change behaviors. Um, the results, at least at the elementary level, we'll talk about first and then the high school level. Whether or not you realize this over the past two years, and it's important to understand what this number is telling you, the entire elementary population in this district, that's all three elementary schools, over the past two years, 10% more of that entire population is hitting proficiency or exceeds um, on state and national testing in math and ELA. In terms of the annual snapshot, um, and this data is actually two years old because they don't have last year's data yet. So this is after the first year um, here. Um, and last year's data, when we get it, will be even better than this because the scores are higher because I have the, the, the raw scores. Um, Brookfield and Randolph Elementary Schools are rated by the state as meeting all academic proficiency requirements. That's in math, ELA, science, and phys ed. It puts all four of those together to make that determination. Not only that, but the piece that we're talking about with why professional development is so important is this last measure here. In terms of how quickly the overall student body in the elementary grades, their achievement is increasing, they're at the highest level, highest rating that the state can give. So not only are they improving, they're improving pretty darn quickly right now because of this work that we've invested in. Um, Braintree Elementary School has achieved the highest rating in both categories. Um, so they're at exceeds across the board um, in terms of uh, student performance in those four areas. And they're also um, achieving better and better every year at an accelerated rate. Um, so there are some very good things that are happening because of the work we've been engaged in. Um, compared to two years ago, each school in the district, Braintree Elementary, Brookfield Elementary, Randolph Elementary, and Randolph Union High School, has gained at least 15 additional students. And this is not counting the students in the preschool programs. Right? If you take a look at the, the little graph here, right? This is the number of kids that are in our first grade program this year. This is the previous year. This is the year before. This is the year before. Every year it's growing at a steady rate. Right? We keep talking about the enrollments. Our enrollments are going up. We're bucking a 20-year trend in the state of Vermont um, of declining enrollments. Uh, matter of fact, they're predicting that the declining enrollments in Vermont are supposed to continue for the next 10 years. That's not happening here. Um, the reason Randolph Union High School is in green um, is because they've gained at least 50, and they've probably gained closer to, to, to 30 or 40. Um, I haven't had the chance to track them all down between VAST and Tech and to, to get the actual number on it, but I, I know the number that the state puts on it at 381, which means we're, we're up quite a few there. So the budget that we're going after this year seeks to do a couple of things. We want to keep things going forward um, at the elementary school um, at the same pace that, that, that it's been happening. But we also, because they're making good, strong gains and, and things are happening the way that they should, we also want to start turning our attention to the, the place that needs it most right now, and that's our middle and our high school age students at, at our UHS. Um, before we kind of talk a little bit about how the budget's going to support that, there are a tremendous number of successes at the high school that people may not be aware of. Um, it does need some work when it comes to the core curriculum, but that does not mean the students are not learning. Um, the high school has a very long, strong history um, of really serving well the social and emotional needs of its students across all grade levels. Um, the students, even in the, uh, the, the safety surveys I, I did for two of the, two of the years now, um, you know, they, they state that it's a comfortable, it's a supportive place. It's also a place where they feel that they have voice. And what that translates to, to these numbers up here, our students have fewer absences. They tend to stay in school, not drop out, and make it through to graduation and graduate than their peers in other districts. On the national stage, um, graduation rates are probably in the 70s. You know, um, across the nation in Vermont, it's 
around 85, um, it can be as high as 89. Um, our graduation rates are typically between 92 and 95 percent. So the kids are here, they, you know, despite, you know, talk at times about things that they like being here and they are attending the school and most of them are making it through graduation. The other piece that people may not know is that that high school attracts over 33 students from other districts who pay tuition to come here. You know, we talk about the value of increasing enrollments um, at between $10,600 and $17,000 per student. Those additional kids over the last couple of years are adding quite a bit on the revenue side. So yes, on the expense side, the, the town is paying more to help us start to get these programs in place. Um, but over the course of time, as these enrollments come up, or go up, there's going to be a break-even point. And hopefully, if we do things right, we're going to get past that break-even point, and the extra revenues rolling in from these additional students is going to far outweigh, um, you know, what we need in the budget, and the budget uh, will actually start to go down. When talking with the parents and the families about why they've chosen the high school, um, these are the things that come up. The advanced placement courses, there are between 10 and 12 advanced placement courses that regularly run at our UHS. There are three or four that run every year. Um, the rest of them, they alternate years. Um, the project-based learning opportunities and internships. If you're a student at a traditional classroom environment, is not your, not your thing. We actually have a program there that a lot of you are familiar with where the students can sit down and they can map out the path that they will take to achieve the learning standards in an alternative setting and graduate. Um, we have extensive extracurricular and athletics program. We've got a full-time athletics program and, and, and the, the number of extracurriculars we have is outstanding. Um, one of the deficiencies that we had in previous years that is now in place is we've got a, a $70,000, $80,000 robotics program that's up and running with 12 kids in it. Um, they're doing some beautiful work. They're getting ready for the competition in Essex Junction in a little while, another month or so. Um, and there's also coding courses that are in place, um, both to support the robotics and for kids that have an interest in computer science um, and programming. And then the other piece that we've already kind of touched on is they've got that multi-tiered system of supports. Right? They have plenty in, uh, programs in that school that any student who may be struggling, whether it's emotionally or whether it's academically, if they want to avail themselves of it, um, where they can go and they can get, get the help that they need. The things that the high school needs right now is they need a comprehensive overhaul of their core curriculum. Uh, this is work that is typically happening every year in most districts, but because we haven't had the structures, we haven't been able to provide for that. Um, what does that mean? Well, core curriculum is science, math, and ELA. Those, those are the big three. Those are also the most public three. Um, what does this mean? It means uh, we need to teach what the state and what the nation expects our students to, to be learning. And those aren't haphazard standards that the state and the nation has decided upon. Uh, they spent a lot of time going out and checking with business and taking a look at what the future of the world holds and deciding what the, those knowledge and, the, and those skills are that students need um, when they put them into place into the, this common core curriculum that we talk about. And that's to make sure that students, when they get out of high school, are successful regardless of what path they take, whether it's just going into the workforce, whether it's going into the military, or whether it's, it's continuing on um, with uh, college. Um, again, we talked a little bit about this, the second piece, you know, training um, in best practice. So we've got to get those facilitators to, to get them in there, help them revise and align the, the, our curricula to state and national standards. But we've also got to give the teachers training in best practice when it comes to delivery. The biggest thing that the Common Core did was changed how you teach these subjects. It looked at the research base. It saw what was most effective, and that's what it prescribes when it comes to teaching math, science, and ELA. That's what the, that eight standards was all about, you know, the eight common practices of math at the elementary school. Those are the practices teachers are supposed to be using and the mindsets that they're supposed to be developing in, in students around mathematics to be successful at. Um, they have also need some training in using the assessments. This is more so at the high school. Um, to inform practice. They have the assessment tools in place. That was a structure we put in place last year. They're looking at data, um, but they need some training to be able to analyze it and figure out best next steps to take to improve things. Um, and the facilitator can provide that. 
And then the big thing, which this graph up here has to, to, to do with, is we've really got to re-envision what happens in the middle school years. You know, that was some of the talk about you know, potentially moving the sixth grade early on. But what happens in the district is this graph is an idealized graph. It's a composite of the last 10 years of data in both math and ELA. And it's a distinctive pattern that falls out every year over the last 10 years. At the elementary level, the students are growing, their score, they're, they're performing very well. They get fifth grade, there's a decline. Fifth to, fifth to sixth grade, there's a, uh, excuse me, fifth to sixth grade, there's a decline. Sixth to seventh grade, there's a huge decline. Continues into eighth grade, and then between eighth and ninth grade, they start to make a recovery, but they never make it back to the level that they were at when they left elementary school. So when you see that and when you see something like that that's been consistent for years and years and years, what it means is we've got some basic structures and programs that are missing there to support these kids. And that was one of the reasons, you know, first why we look at the data, but one of the things that we were able to, to pull from it. Um, so one of the big pieces that's happening right now as part of this professional development is uh, the folks from Williamstown are going to be coming over um, in a few weeks to talk with our staff here on the next professional development day, talk about how they turn their school around. Over the course of three years, they've become one of the highest performing schools in the state. Um, and then we're going to spend some time visiting over there. Primary focus um, is the middle school level, but there are things that we could potentially learn. doesn't mean we have to do any of them, but there's some good ideas that we might be able to pick up in terms of what they're doing across all grades. But the big focus is what are you doing with these 6th, 7th, 8th graders? Uh, middle school technically starts in 5th. Um, you know, if you talk about the, the students themselves, that middle school mindset, the transition the kids are, are going through to see what we can bring in. And that team, Lisa Floyd, will be heading up, um, has been pulling a panel together to start taking a look at the research and what's out there to try to come up with some ideas about how we can improve the existing structure that we have here and now. Ah, so all the good stuff. We've kind of talked about the details um, about all these, and I am happy to go into more depth on each of these little budget lines. Um, but basically, you can take the budget and you can split it into two pieces. You, there's a discretionary side, and there's a non-discretionary side. Discretionary um, are the things that we're adding that we could remove. Um, but they are typically all the things that are geared up for um, improving student outcomes, right? There, that 405,000 that you're looking at there has a whole bunch of things in there. It's got the, it's the new teacher at Braintree because their enrollments are go up and we've never given them a new teacher uh, to coincide with it. It's the professional development line at $106,000. It's um, the money to keep and maintain the preschool. Now, what's interesting about this is I want to tie it back to enrollments and the revenues that pour in because of it. Because we've been doing this work over the last two years, we are generating revenue. How much revenue are we predicting for next year? That much right there. So yes, I'm asking for what? 405 plus $11,000, 415,130 as a total um, to keep things moving forward. But because of the work we've already done and because of the new enrollments and because of the revenue that we generate from the after school program in the preschools, 295,000 of it is offset right off the top. So really what I'm asking for out of a nearly a $20 million budget is I'm asking for $120,000, $130 to keep things moving forward in this district. The stuff on this side, this is the non-discretionary things. These are the things that we don't have a choice for the most part. We have to pay them. You know, could we kind of make cuts here? Yeah, you could. But if we do, it means that we're going to be violating the law or violating a state mandate or violating a regulation if we cut back on it. Um, health care, we spent a lot of time talking about this. Good news on the health care is um, that at least the arbitrator clarified his decision a few days ago um, and said that the new health care uh, piece goes into effect halfway through next year. So the total impact of this is on us is you know up to seven hundred and um, three forty so six plus eighty. Um, it's twice the three forty is the total impact, but we're able to split the impact over two years now. So yeah, there's a big increase, but it's split over two years. Um, I'm tired of those ideas to add. 
Um, facilities, we're still looking for a $32,000 increase there. The reason that we're doing that is they have lines in their budget that are meant for certain specific things that we talked about, buying supplies, um, providing for trash removal, the composting that we now have to pay for that was a, a mandate that came in a, a few years ago. Those lines historically have never been where they needed to be to actually cover the cost that they really are. From what I can tell in previous years, they were actually part of what was coming out of the reserve funds to cover those shortfalls every year. I'm trying to build them into the regular budget. You do that for a very important reason. We could still pull them out of surplus, but you put them into the regular budget because one of the purposes behind the budget is transparency. It's so people know what you're spending and what you're spending it on. So it's appropriate for, the, for it to be there. Special education, this one is in yellow. Um, the increase is 255801 for next year, which is about a third of what the previous year's increases have been. Um, we are restructuring, we talked about that, restructuring the special education program um, to move things from a managing model to an improvement model. Um, basically, what we've got is we've got a lot of paraprofessionals who are great people, but paraprofessionals in a high school are like orderlies in a hospital. Um, they manage people, they help, they help folks clean, they help folks eat, they help folks with their mobility, but they are not in and of themselves healers. It is the jobs of the surgeons and the nurses um, and the doctors to do the healing. And what we have right now is we have a system that is heavy on orderlies and we don't have enough doctors to go around. We don't have enough special education teachers to do the, the important work of healing our kids. Um, so basically, we've got enough special education teachers to keep them alive and not to heal them. So the change in this model is reducing the number of paraprofessionals and using that money to purchase more special education teachers, as well as changing the model for how the, the services are delivered to something that's more effective. So that the hope is over time, um, we're actually treating the students, they're coming off their plans and we get our special education numbers down um, to something that's comparable. We're almost twice the state and national average for the percentage of our kids that are on IEPs. And it's because the model that we've had for years is not healing the kids. It's maintaining them, it's managing them, it's getting them through the day, but it's not providing a lasting effect. Um, so this is um, basically in there. It's, a, it's an increase, but it's an anticipation of potential outplacements for students. Um, the other piece that's uh, pretty much non-discretionary, there's a little leeway in it, but the, that's the fact that we've got to build in an amount um, for salary increases because it's a negotiation year. So that's what this is. So the non-discretionary stuff is on this side. If I added everything up right um, for this year, it's 1.3 million. The discretionary stuff, um, if we're just looking at, at it in terms of expenses, it's 415,000. Um, if we take into account the offsetting revenues, it's actually 120. So we've spoken a little bit about this at the last board meeting where, yeah, I can go back and I can cut, but the difference between paying these two together and just paying this one is so minimal, why bother? Um, but, you know, if the budget fails and whatnot, we'll have to come back and talk, but there really isn't a lot I can cut. And this piece um, right here... You know, this was unanticipated. You know, the expectation was when, you know, the state kept selling it that we're going into the negotiations because we want to cut costs. They didn't. Um, and it was a surprise to a lot of districts across the state. Um, our summary. And again, we're looking at the expense size of things. Um, last year's budget, $18.5 million, will increase to $19.7 million. Taking revenues into account, so this is, you got what we're spending plus what's coming in, and then what's left over is what we've got to ask for. It's a 6.47% increase. And hey, if you remember that article I sent to you from, I think it was Vermont Digger, when they were talking about the impact of healthcare negotiations this year, what did they say? A well, 6 to 7% increase across the state. So we're right in there with where the rest of the state is. Um, the nice thing about this budget um, is that it keeps us below the spending threshold. Um, what happens is there are various thresholds in terms of dollar amount, what you're paying per student. 
Um, if you cross certain thresholds, some things can be triggered. Up to $10,833 per student. Um, that comes from the education fund. Every person in the state pays for the, that dollar amount equally. From here to the red line, that comes from local as well as the ed fund. Probably about 33% of it is coming from other people's pockets, not this town. The thing we don't want to do is cross this red line because anything above $18,756 per student, um, all of a sudden it's triggered and it all comes out of local pockets. So we're not at the red line. And we've got a pretty good buffer um, there. The health care piece is going to push a lot of districts over the red line, um, just so folks know. So we'll be going from $17.1 um, per student to $17.9. So questions on any of these pieces? When the state set the, that red line, was it before or after the negotiations? Before? We just got that about two weeks ago, okay. if that. Um, the state has been actually really late on getting a lot of its um, data out. We talked about that. I'd like to tell you what the revenues are, but I can't. Um, a lot of that, that, that data was supposed to be available first week of December, and it never came. Um, so it's been rolling in. Even the, um, the health care piece, you know, this piece, that arbitrator's clarification was last week, like late last week that I got it. Um, so we didn't even know if it was going to be, you know, the full 700 and whatever thousand or if it was going to be the 320 or 340. Uh, the other piece that's still in limbo in the budget is now that the arbitrator has clarified, um, you know, what his decision was, is now VHI has come back and said, oh, by the way, um, because we didn't know what the, the negotiations was going to end up being, is they're coming back and saying, now we have to reassess what the overall, just the, the yearly increase is supposed to be. It was 12.9%. Now that they reassess, now that the, the state health care piece is there, they may reassess higher. It may be a bigger increase, it may be a smaller. We don't have that information put in this budget. So when they planned out this process for negotiations and, and put the end dates on it so late, they, they really didn't make things easy on folks. Um, trying to be responsible and, and plan things out. Um, final note, so the dollar amounts when people go to vote are going to look like they're in discrepancy. They're not. Um, we talked a little bit about this last year. Um, the federal government is requiring folks to show in their overall budget how much money is federal money coming from the federal grants like title funds. So the problem with that is, is that I've got to put that on the voting. But it's that that's actually coming from the state appropriations. The other 900000 is actually the, the federal grant money that we receive in addition to it that does not come out of people's pocket at the state level. Um, so that sometimes if people see that, it's going to look like a huge jump, but it's, it's not. There's another almost million dollars in there um, that's added on to the budget that just because we have to declare how much we've gotten from the federal government, if that makes sense. So I'll be talking an awful lot about that in the, the open forums as we lead up to the March 1st vote and in the communications that I send out. Um, bottom line, what does this all mean if we go with this 6.47% increase? Um, Brookfield, I feel sorry for you. We'll talk about it when we get to the next slide. Um, but a lot of these, um, the, the, the change depends upon your common level of appraisal. Your common level of appraisal in Brookfield was always very high. Now they adjusted it down to normal, so it means you're going to have a, see a fairly sizable increase compared to everybody else. The Braintree, um, this budget is a 4.69 um, cent increase per $100 of assessed home value. The average home value in Vermont has gone up since last year. Last year it was 201,000, this year it's 253,000. Based on this number, average tax increase for schools, um, for the average person uh, in Braintree would be $119, which is $9.88 a month. Now, that's only true if you don't hit the income sensitivity levels. Income sensitivity levels are fairly high in Vermont. So if your family income is less than $90,000, 
and your home is valued at less than $400,000, you can fill out a little form when you do your taxes to take advantage of the income sensitivity threshold, and you will not be paying this amount. You will be paying something less. The formula is too freaking complicated for me to figure out, so <laughs> you'll have to have your, your accountant probably do it for you to tell you what it will actually be. I usually can figure this stuff out and it sticks with me for about an hour and then if I don't think about it for more than an hour, I lose it. Um, Brookfield, and again, this is because your common level of assessment went from 115% um, in previous years down to about 103 this year. And whenever that happens, um, you either pay more or pay less. Usually if you're over-assessed, you pay less. If you're under-assessed, you pay more. So you guys are looking at a 13 cent increase per hundred dollars of assessed value. Average home with 253, your tax increase you're looking at 329, which is 2740 a month. But again, you know, as long as people know they can fill out that form, um, that sensitivity income threshold uh, uh, can, can reduce that quite a bit for you. And then lastly, for all of us living in Randolph, 4.97 cents. That's what we're looking at. So $126 going up and $10.48 a month. It's um, kind of bottom lines here. So budget, there are three things that you as a board are looking at tonight to vote on, three or four actually. We've got the OSSD budget, which we've just kind of completed talking about, so it's real important that folks have questions that we talk about them. The next piece is we'll talk about the surplus funding and putting it into the reserve funds. Then there's the tech center, and then there's Raymond. So four things that you're actually doing. So this is the OSSD budget. This is Braintree Elementary, Randolph Elementary, um, Brookfield Elementary, and the high school. Which questions? Does the board have any questions? Does, you, does anyone else in this room have questions for Lane about this? Either means they did a good you job, or I was completely or... incomprehensible. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't even know. I what mean, to some ask. of them. <laughs> if it, there there is time, um, you know, if the board board votes this in tonight, there's through March third. You know, I'll be going to another four or five open forums to try to talk with people about what it means and the impact. So it's just get people out and talk, talk or ask the questions. I guess. I'm curious, do you know what the like total percentage that the healthcare cost is, like as a percentage of the total budget? Do you have that? Uh, we could actually probably calculate it. We're pretty I mean, close I to I don't it. want to haul it you out. Yeah. The, the health care. the increase? The total well, percentage. Well, I see the increase. I'm just trying to get a sense of the, the scope of the increase oh. by understanding like, what the whole cost of the health The The whole the cost that's split over two years or the, the impact this year and then the impact next year? Um, I can give you a general percent. Just it depends on how. So it's it's about 740 to 780, um, the total cost yeah. that that we're predicting. And we did pretty good numbers. It's hard to predict. It could be as high as a million if all the support staff take. Right. Um, Obviously, it's hard. If all of them. So what we did is we checked and talked to them and said, Hey, what's your family situation? And most of them were willing to share that with us. You know, so. Okay, these guys are two two families, so they'll probably stay stay a two person. This is a single. This is a family. Um, so based on that, we're we're looking at 740 to 780 total impact. So, Go ahead. so when you did that, did you ask? And I don't know if it's even allowed to ask, but are you are you getting? They don't have to provide the information. Right. They don't have. But yeah. you know, how many people are gonna are are planning to take it when they weren't before? Because a lot of the support staff <coughs> get their health insurance through their spouse mm -hmm. or um, other places? Like so unless, unless they're connect. working, unless their spouse is, is uh, working at another school, I can guarantee you our health care package is better than what they could get in private industry around here. I guarantee you that, hands down. We're having worked in private industry, and I can guarantee you that. So it, it, that doesn't guarantee anything, but it's a motivator to, to switch. Um, it's a motivator to switch. So that's in the back of the minds as well. You know, that, that was one of the things, you know, even 30 years ago when I was in Vermont, was the health care was always great. Pay sucked. Excuse my language. But, you know, it's be blunt about it, but the health care you were taking care of. Um, and they preserved that, you know, pretty, pretty well through the years. 
So um, it's a good question. Um, probably 20% this year. So 20% this year and 20% next year. Could have been, could have been, a, could have, could have been about a third, third to a half of this year's budget. It had been the whole seven, 740,000 was there. Yeah, it was a, a third of the total twenty yeah. some million dollar budget. Yeah. 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 So you figure you, you, it's, it's very painful. Third to a half. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And again, it was. It's not that. So, and I, I want to step this be, step back as a human. People deserve health insurance. I mean, that's. I have a, fa a fun, fundamental belief in that. What happened in this process that the state engaged in was they took our ability to plan it out in a logical way, um, for people. You know, to, to have this huge increase all of a sudden when they told us they'd be saving us money. I don't know. Throws you for a loop. Okay, quick, uh, quick question on the um, uh, first student. So your, your slide said something about uh, 17.98 um, for dollars per student. How, how do you feel that the, you know, with that budget, that the taxpayers will look at that versus the increase on the property tax through the three towns? It all depends. Um, last year, we looked at an 11% increase. We were trying to pit, hit reset um, on things. Um, and the reason we were trying to hit reset was because the folks had done a very good job of keeping things, the cost, very low. But we lost a lot of things when that happened, right? We didn't get to do the professional development, the curriculum work at the high school. We didn't get to revamp the, the, the special education. And in the end, it ended up costing us more money. So the intent was to come back this year and have a nominal, you know, not a small. I, I, what I was trying to do was come back with what I call a level service budget. So probably 3 percentage total. Um, so I actually achieved that pretty darn close had it not been for the, the health care piece. Numbers, so it's, yeah. It looks good. Yeah. Okay. Had it not been for the health care piece, I, I would have been in, in that range. Um, the other piece to realize, too, is that in terms of the increases, we're building the structures to get us where we want to go. We got a whole lot of them in last year. We got 85%. This year, we're going to get another 10%. Another we don't have a heck of a lot more that we need at this point in time. There will always be some, you know. I, I might be asking for a hundred thousand here or there um, for things uh, to really get things accelerated, but we should be in pretty good shape after this year. Um, more importantly than that is, as those improvements take off and people start to look at this as being a, a really good, viable place, especially high school, to send their kids. As those enrollment goes goes up, right? It's going to stabilize the taxes, and it could even have them come down. We could, with enough enrollment, we could actually build things and have people's actual tax bills, personal tax bills, go down. The school budget will go up, but their personal tax bills will go down. Okay. That's the goal. Right? Okay, on, on that, with, with uh, families <laughs> possibly, sorry, families possibly growing, is there any uh, solid information that the Tri Town here is is actually growing, like more more people are. Yeah, our, our, our enrollments are going up, and that was the graph with showing you what's happening with the first grade class each year. But you're talking population. Population. And, and oh, in terms of outside yeah. of the school piece? Yeah, well, yeah, to be able to support that number, saying that we're, we're doing better, um, you know, more, more enrollment. Well, is that because of, of the age of people are, you know, the age of the children are, are going into the school district aspect, or is it because we have newer families buying and renting homes in the three Brain towns. tree, it's newer families that are buying homes. Okay. Um, and it's interesting, um, one of the reasons it's happening, uh, there were two or three folks that I spoke with that came in. Um, they're from Massachusetts. Um, it's, the tele it's the telecommuting for work. Uh, because yeah. most work is done on the computer now. They do not have to be in the office. Correct. And they don't want to live in Mass. Yeah. Um, so they, they move into Braintree, they do, do their work over the computer, and then you know once every two weeks or, or once a month, they shoot down 89, they go spend the day at the office that they have to spend. Yeah, so I think you're going to see a lot more of that across the country. I think that's a big piece of the demographic shift that's happening. Vermont's a great place to raise kids. It is. It's a great, great, great place to live and not fight the traffic. Okay, one, one more thing, and then I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll shut my gap. Um, so special, on the special education aspect, um, and I'm going to say this incorrectly, so correct me, and then try to answer the question. Um, so the special education aspect here, you were looking at bringing in 
more of the professional trained side folks in decreasing the, um, the, the, the aids yeah. kind of thing. Um, what type of impact would that have to our community of the special educators? Um, you know, are you looking for the next six years sort of decreasing that population? Are you looking for immediate decrease of the population? So what the goal of this is, yeah. um, if you take all the kids in the district, right now 21% of them are special education students. They're on an IEP. And that is growing by 1% <coughs> per year. If you look across the nation, it's between 12 and 14%. In Vermont, it's about 14%. So we're almost double. Why are we almost double? Well, my argument is based on data. So it doesn't mean I'm right, but it means that, that if, you, if you get me in an argument, I got data to back it up, Correct. is that we are not providing enough service to the students that need it to be able to actually get them to improve so they can come off the plans. And the data that I have is I looked at every special educator teacher at the elementary level to see what their schedules were. And at best, they're able to provide 15 minutes here and there to provide service to a kid. There is no way you are going to change a kid's life that's got some, some specific needs at 15 minutes a couple times a week. Hour a day, in six months, you might be able to get them off the plane. So we, we've fallen into this, as far as I can tell, I, that's what I call it, the managing. The, 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 the paraprofessionals are awesome because they come in, they get the kid through the day. Right. But at the end of the day, when the kid goes home, he doesn't have any skills, any more skills than he had when he started that day because the paraprofessional can't provide that. Yeah. I, first of all, I want to say I really appreciate that you are pointing to, I think, a really urgent need to address, like, yeah, I think in our special ed realm, they're, like our kids are not getting their needs met to the degree they need to. So I really appreciate that. And I do, I think I would agree, and I think I'm not a special educator, but I work with a lot of them, and I think they would all agree that having more people in the department is, is an urgent need. I do have to take issue a little bit with, with the statement that, that paraprofessionals are nothing more than orderlies. I mean, I think I have um, worked with some paraprofessionals who I think are probably knows those kids better and connect with those kids better than any other professional staff in the school. I think part of that has to do with the fact that they're often from the community, often from you know, families that are more like the kid's family and have that connection. So I think that's just like a, a valuable thing that doesn't always show up in data, um, that particularly for kids with socio-emotional reasons for being in special ed is really crucial. Um, and then I also just have to, you know, point to, I would definitely invite the board to come check out, like, Gary Curley and Kelly Tucker's classroom, the Product to Achieve classroom, which I think is essentially doing the work of special ed. And I, I know that that's something that you it's part of the are trying to address. That we talked about. Totally. But, but I just think not to paint with too broad a brush around special education. Which, I'm, I'm sorry, around paraprofessionals, which yeah. I don't think you're even I'm trying not, to do. I'm not devaluing paraprofessionals. What I'm saying is they are not the right tool for the job we need right now. I, I echo I think what, what Teb is saying and, and um, one of my I think it's great having a one to three having more special educators I, I 100% agree is an absolute necessity um, kids are not getting the services and, and having that um, level of instruction that, that I think they need um, my I have two concerns one is is I think um, the paraeducators that we do have, and I'm going to speak from an elementary level, are performing not necessarily not the direct instruction, um, but a very necessary um, part of that child's program. And I'm concerned that that support's not going to be there for those kids. And my other concern is that there is a, a shortage of special educators. So, um, and I don't know if that's been looked at or how you plan to address it. Mm -hmm. um, that you you know you can put out the call to hire these people, um, but that they're not there. And and how do you get so, someone who's not? How do you attract them and how do you get them when they're not? Um, so again, two two things. The 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 over reliance on para educators is why we're in the boat. We're in with 21 percent of the students uh, being in IEPs. 
They do an amazing job managing and helping uh, through the day that they are not able to remediate the kids in the way that they need to be remediated. As far as the special educators are concerned, is we have not had a problem hiring special educators. And the reason that we haven't had a problem hiring special educators is because we pay about 10000 more than any district around us um, for our teachers. I'm going to recant of me shutting my app, and I just want to throw this real quick in. <laughs> is, uh, with, the, with the special educators, is it possible that with, with these folks on, on the lower end of the education level, is it possible to offer them some better training to, let's say, a, a paraeducator is making $15 an hour at, at, at their level, and to say, you know, uh, sir, ma'am, if you take these courses in right away to better your ability to service these children and do better for our district, and we'll give you X dollars more or X, is, is that something that we, we, we can look they at They have as a access district? to be able to take courses, and we have at least one person who's actually nearing the completion of their degree that that's already true. scheduled, uh, you know. You're going to be in, and you're going to get interviewed next year when we, yeah. So that that's awesome. going. Perfect. This um, that's one of the other nice things in the, in the district is this uh, the ability for folks to go off and take classes. It's huge here. Um, you know, there's not a lot of limits. So but again, you know, things things that do help and support. But right. no, spe the special education. You're right. They are tough to find. Uh, but we've we've been lucky because the salaries for teachers are so much higher than the surrounds. Um, and North, Northfield was the, the big one is, you know, we got pretty much every veteran Northfield te teacher last year, they came here because they were all making 10000 more when they walked through the door. Um, I mean, it makes, makes a big difference. And the, the board board and the, the past superintendent is to be commended for, for that, for keeping those salaries. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We need to get going for our, we'll be here until midnight. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so we need to now we need to do the surplus RTC, and these are quick. So, surplus. Um, just so folks know how this works, is at the end of each year, if there is money left over, the board has the option to do a couple of things with that money that is left over at the end of a budget season. Um, in most cases, the board votes to put it into a reserve fund. There are four reserve funds that are set up right now. There's a transportation reserve fund, there's a facilities reserve fund, special ed reserve fund that we put in last year, and a, a legal reserve fund. Um, transportation is for the replacement of buses and other vehicles that we use in and around the district. The facilities reserve fund um, was initially set up, I believe, for the replacement of this roof, which is, is, is going to be replaced within the next year or so. Um, the special education reserve fund we put into place last year um, because the state is changing how it is funding special education and we still don't have all the details to be able to calculate or predict and I am fearful that we're going to get into the middle of a, a school year I'm going to have two or three high need <coughs> students come in that cost me 100 to 300,000 a year and not have the money to cover it under the new state plan so this is just to have some money there in case that occurs so that we don't have to do something horrible in terms of the budget um, and then a legal reserve fund that was established a long time ago that has 42000 um, doesn't need a lot in there um, because a lot of what we could potentially be sued for or have to pay out is covered under our liability insurances. Um, so there is quite a bit of money. That's the amount that's in there right now in each of those. Um, and we had some discussion about the size of surpluses. Um, last year, the surplus at the end of the year was $546,040 um, that you had to vote on. Um, a lot of that was because we had people that um, retired, right? They were at the top of the, the pay scale, um, and they came in low. And then we get um, some reimbursements for kids that move in, um, you know, that we had to plan for ahead of time, and then we get re reimbursed at the end of the year. This year, this is our surplus. Mm -hmm. the folks have talked, well, can't you guys predict a little bit better um, <laughs> on, on behalf of the taxpayers? Well, we did a pretty good job. So surplus that we're talking about this year is 85697 which is pretty darn good in a $20 million budget. Um, that said, where did that surplus come from? Um, we had a lot of folks go out high, we had retirements that went out at the top of the pay scale, but we hired at the top of the pay scale. The difference was is that the folks that we hired when they came in, they didn't, didn't need health insurance because their spouse already had it in another school district. So that's the savings on the health insurance that they didn't take. 
So my recommendation to the board and what, what shows up in the warrant is my recommendation is that that 85,000 goes into that special education fund. We have more than enough to cover the roof and then some probably twice over. Um, this has not really been tapped and we also put 100,000 a year into the regular budget, actually 104,000 a year into the regular budget to cover you know, bus replacements and um, truck replacements if we need to. This is the great unknown and it doesn't have a tremendous amount in there and one kid can cost upwards of $300,000. So that's my recommendation on where it goes. Legal Reserve Fund, I don't know if you guys have ever tapped it. I didn't see it. It's relatively it. new and it was because there was a, a potential problem. Yeah, just a plan for it. Um, so that's one of the decisions that you have to make tonight when you vote is you know, where does that surplus money go. The other option that you have with the surplus money is you do nothing. If you do nothing, it does not go back into local taxpayers' pockets. It goes back to the Ed Reserve Fund. It goes back to the Reserve Fund that serves the whole state, which is one of the reasons people like to. Oh no, no, no! Oh no! no. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why people like to, to keep it here. But for transparency, I want to keep it open and honest. Um, so questions on surplus, and then the other two are really. Good. Tech Center. Tuition this year will be seventeen thousand seven seventy eight. It's down a hundred and some odd dollars from last year. Um, one of the things that's happening is they're in a, a transition. Um, forestry program went out, was included with the ag tech. He's getting geared up um, to put in another program there. He hasn't decided which. He's looking at either HVAC or electrical because both should have a high draw of kids. Um, he is also, but it's a little bit longer planning period, he is also talking about, um, it's probably two years out, is um, doubling the size of the nursing program and making it kind of a, a two-part um, because the demand is there. Um, but uh, right, right now the, you know, the tuition's gone down. So questions at all on Tech Center? Would you have to vote on that one? And then the big other last one is the Raven Agreement. Um, their tuition last year to go into the Raven program, that's the one where we move the buildings. Um, it serves um, students that would cost between um, sixty dollars and 120000 to send them to other programs. Um, it's a collaborative. There are other sending schools that send students into our program and, and, and pay the tuition for them to be there. It's designed to be a break-even um, scenario. Um, so last year uh, the tuition was 24285 This year it's 24299 why don't tuitions match inflation? It's too complicated to explain. In, in, Ra in Raven, <laughs> um, the biggest thing determining what the, the total costs are are the facilities, which is improved. Um, I can't put a specific number on, on it, but they've gone mm -hmm. down, and the number of kids. Right. I got more, more kids with the same number of teachers. Don't have to charge each one as much. Mm -hmm. Wasn't but expecting that one. That one. But we're capped at 14, right, in our current facility. They, they, they. He typically tries to to run it around 14. Um, it's been as low as 12. It's been as high as 18. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've talked about with the program is there's always a need in excess of what we have. Right. That's what I thought. There was a wait list. So there, there are two possibilities if we decide to move that way because we have two, two teachers. It's designed to have two teachers. There are two teachers in the budget. Um, the first is, is we set the building up so that if you build away from the street, you can actually build onto the building and add more space um, to double the enrollment. Um, that wouldn't be too costly to do. The second thing is because there are two general areas that the kids are in, um, one area is the classroom area, the other area is the actual um, the, the mechanics area um, where they work on all the machinery. Half the day one group is here, half the day one group is there, and then they switch and you could double the enrollment that way. So those are discussions that, that we've had. Uh, but we've, we've had a little bit of trouble. That's a specialized program. That is one area. To, to Nora's point, where we have had trouble finding a person, but it's a very specialized program as, as, as part of it. Because we budgeted for two teachers, we've got a teacher and a, and a, a pair of educator. Yeah. So unless there's questions, that's the totality of the budget. Do you want us uh, a vote to approve each one of those 
uh, separately then? Um, I think it's in your consent agenda. Let me see where it's we not can. in the consent. It's a separate vote. Yeah, so it should be it should be a separate vote then. It's not in the consent. But I think you can do it however you want. Yeah. You, um, you can even move to put it in the consent agenda and then just. Well, um, why don't we? I think we should should vote for it, um, separate from the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve? the OSSD budget as presented. So moved. Second. Any further questions? All those in favor of approving the OSSD budget, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK, the budget carries. Um, surplus. Surplus is next. Do I have a motion to um, allocate any surplus funds into the special ed fund? So moved. Second. Questions? All those in favor of allocating the special, um, the surplus funds into the special education fund? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries as well. And then we um, have the RTCC budget, which um, is a little bit lower than last year. Um, I have a motion to approve the RTCC budget as presented. Any other questions? Give it to, Rachel, give it to me. I have the discussion. Don't down yet. <laughs> All those in favor of approving yeah. the RTCC Spread budget, it. please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And last is the Raven budget, which is nearly static. Um, I have a motion to approve the Raven budget as presented. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Okay. So all those budgets are carried. Um, next, we have a brief discussion about negotiations with unions. Laura, how about the warning? Oh, I did I skip over to, the warning? I think we have to oh, I did. The okay. Yes, we have a copy of the warning in our packet. Um, we will have to sign the warning, and I have a um, blank for that here. Your, there's a blank sheet in your um, orange one. Okay. All right, so this morning is um, a required meeting, the day before our town meeting. Um, this is the meeting that happens at the high school at 6 p.m. on the Monday before town meeting. It's pretty much written as required, correct? Yeah. I mean, there's no really leeway in changing. No, it's just the amounts in there, the budget and the surplus. Okay. It's really pretty simple this year because we have just that one transfer. Yeah. Paul mentioned that not many board members attended this meeting last year. But there were mm -hmm. some members who were disturbed by that. So right. I think so we'll just be aware of that. Yes. Please try to make an effort to attend if you are around. Um, do I have a motion to approve the draft warning for the uh, district meeting? So moved. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the warning is written? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, I will pass around this. Um, everyone needs to sign next to their name. All right. Now we can go on to the uh, union negotiation discussion. So I think. Um, because it was a, it was a little while ago, um, probably six months now, that you know we kind of revamped the who's on what. Um, so just to make sure that, that folks recognize who, who's on which negotiating committee, and um, if folks are still still committed and have the actual time, because people's life lives can change. Um, just kind of confirm that, and then I can talk a little bit about the first meeting um, on the CBA and a little bit too about the first meeting uh, for the support staff. So CBA negotiating team was Paul, Melody, and Brian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the first meeting, um, been emailing around a little bit, but that's January 22nd. Um, we should plan on meeting around 510, um, which is about 20 minutes before the actual meeting, and that'll be right here, um, just to sit down and kind of connect a little bit, talk a little bit, um, so that we're not taking time away from the, the, the teachers when they come in. 
Um, basic agenda for that first meeting um, is reviewing the ground rules, setting future dates, um, having all proposals on the table, and then um, time to, to clarify. Um, so in other words, you know, the union will have its proposals about changes, we'll have ours, and then it's time to kind of explain what it means, the rationale behind it, and for the other side to ask questions. Um, would be the goal for that. Um, support staff team, Ashley, Ann, Kay, and Rachel. And then the first meeting is February 5th. Um, that, again, is here at 510 um, here in the media center. And that, again, is setting up to meet about 20 minutes early just so that, that we can connect before um, the, the union team comes in so we're not, not taking our time at the beginning of the meeting. So just say if folks are still committed, then we should be good to go. Yeah, and please make every effort to attend. It's really important that we have a contingency of mm -hmm. board members there. Okay, so next we have the confidential employee agreement. So um, like the, the CBA, like the support staff master agreement, there is also a, an agreement for the bus drivers. Uh, that was actually redone in my first year here. I think they have a year left. That was a four-year agreement. Um, but there is also the confidential employees. They have a master agreement as well. Um, Lenny, you can chime, chime in if, if, if you feel it necessary. Um, okay. That was never, there was never any real discussion um, about that when it came due every year. Um, the, the previous superintendent kind of did his thing, um, and that was it. So we had an opportunity to kind of sit down with them this year, I did, and kind of talk about, you know, what's in there, what are some needs. And then they had a couple of needs that I want to float past the board, get some feedback on, because within the next month or two, I'm going to be putting a, an agreement um, for the confidential staff in front, in front of you, I've been asking you to vote to approve it. Could you uh, just clarify for everyone yeah, here what yeah. confidential employees are? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the confidential secretaries, um, superintendent's secretary, the, the student services director, special education director, secretary, um, our payroll folks in the office. We have one over at the high school. Um, we have a, a person in the technical um, who, who works on computers and things that's also under that agreement. There's one more than I'm missing. There's like seven of us. Yeah. There's so seven. you're it's included a, in that too? Yeah, yeah. it's a very yeah. small group of people. And the people in my office, basically, and one at the high school and one at RTCC. Yeah. Um, compared to a, a, a regular secretary, these folks typically work with sensitive information. Um, and it's important in some cases there's training that goes along with being able to do that, like the background record checks. Um, and typically they get paid a little bit more than the, the, the normal secretary because of that uh, administrative assistant. So a couple of things in, in looking through uh, their agreement that actually jumped out to me as well uh, was this. Um, they don't have anything in there for bereavement leave. Mm -hmm. So it would be appropriate to give them three days of bereavement leave. Um, they do not have any wording in there about their vacation days. Um, so what ends up happening, I used to go through this as an administrator in, in my previous district, is um, you know they're not allowed to carry over the vacation days. So what ends up happening is because the, the school year and the contracts start on July 1st, they don't get time over the summer to use up their vacation days that they've just earned, because they earned them on a prorated basis. Um, to be able to actually use them so they end up losing them. Because right? when school gets out into June, you only have a couple of days to take vacation. So my suggestion is going to be um, allowing them to carry over those days until the first day of school with students. They're very good about not taking them while students are in, in, in session, um, but to give them that ability. That way they can take time when people aren't here, go off and enjoy their vacations and use them all. Um, the last piece um, has to do with the healthcare language. Um, the statewide healthcare agreement affects everybody. And um, I kind of did the same thing um, when the board was kind of talking about my contract as well, is there was a, a line that was put in there about my benefits would be adjusted to whatever the teacher benefits. There should mirror the same um, in that, and so I'll be putting that in there as well. 
The other thing, too, that I'm required to do under executive limitations and because it's the right thing, was to kind of take a look at where their salaries sit um, in relationship to the comparables. Um, so I've taken a preliminary look at that data um, and across the seven of them, um, so not individually, but across the seven of them, um, to get them up to the comparables, there is a need to add about 10000 um, Total money? Or? Total, total money. Um, and so I'll be recommending that as well um, to get them into the comparable range. Um, similar to kind of what we did with the support staff that, that weren't in the comparables last year. Um, so unless there's discussion or comments, those are kind of my intents right now um, in terms of what I'm seeing and looking at. And so you'll bring forward uh, an yep. amendment Next yep. Need, um, yep. okay. Yeah, similar to what we did with the bus drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about what the changes are. Uh, we can hit, hit again why if need be, and then ask for a little more. Are there any other questions for Lane in this preliminary? All right. Um, next, we've got um, two monitoring reports 2.4 and 2.5. Um, this is our second read. They were presented last month. Um, everyone has had taken the time to look them over and do any further investigation if, if needed be. Um, Lane, do you have anything more to say about them? No, we talked about them last time in Lester's question. Um, 2.5 was the real easy one. That was the succession planning, um, you know, in case I'm, I'm taken out by a bus. Um, so in the short term, and we've actually already used it once, um, Robin, um, because most of what I deal with deals with budgetary <coughs> and human resources uh, pieces, which Robin works on constantly all day long. If it's a week or less, it's Robin making the decisions. If it goes longer than that, then it shifts over to Erica. And they both have um, notarized letters um, that you know they can present in case they're signing for me if I'm out. Um, and 2.4 was basically what we just went through with uh, financial planning around the budget. And it's just ensuring that you know proper thought and research has gone into to, to what I'm presenting for the board to take a look at um, in, in its most general terms. If everyone's read over the monitoring reports, do you have any questions, further questions, really? Okay. Um, let's vote to accept the EL reports 2.4 and 2.5 as together. One vote. Do I have a uh, motion to accept the two of them? So moved. A second? Second. And um, any questions or comment? All right. Please say aye if you vote to accept the reports 2.4 and 2.5 as written. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, next, we move to advocacy next month, um, February. Can't remember the date. Tenth, I believe we have the meeting with the legislators. Did you invite Jeff Francis and Sue? So Linda, from mm -hmm. we've heard back. Jeff Francis, Mark Jeff was good. Mark was good. Um, I haven't heard back from Sue because I had sent it to Nicole and oh, yeah. I get the message. Okay. So, but I sent it again to Sue. I sent it again to Jay. I called the new guy, Peter Reed, mm -hmm. yep. and his wife answered the phone, and she was going to tell him she thought he would be really excited okay. about it. Great. So I will write, remind him all. Good. I'm planning to do that in a couple, okay. couple weeks before. So as usual, we put the, that um, meeting with the legislators as the first thing on mm -hmm. our agenda, so that will mm -hmm. sort of be right at 6.30 till mm -hmm. 7.30. We usually allow an hour for okay. questions and discussion. That will be at RUHS in the media center. Yeah. Is there anything else we need to plan for? Usually, um, the tech culinary provides something to eat, right? Yeah, I can get. Well, I don't know if tech will, but I'll get Karen to do something. Okay. Yeah, it's a little more complicated with the tech. Okay. Yeah, I usually eat. Yeah, the water, you, water or the coffee. Yeah, the water, really coffee. Really, very little. Yeah. We need. Okay. Yeah. No, I'll get Karen to, to do that. Yeah. Light refreshment. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, and come prepared with questions. Um, we've got Jeff Francis from the um, the PA and and Sue from the VSBA. So um, they're really people with great yeah, yeah. knowledge of what's going on and in the state house. Incredibly knowledgeable yeah. about anything we could ever want to know. All right. Um, for the consent agenda, we've got uh, minutes from last meeting um, enclosed with the agenda. We have a professional contract. I see just that one name. Mm -hmm. um, a new reading teacher at the high school. Um, 
this, you need to set the high school choice capacity. What were you going to propose for that? Um, it stays the same as last year. Um, so that's that's the, the high school choice. It's a part of the state law. So 20 out, 100 in. That's you know part of that 33 kids we got coming to the high school. Um, this is through that program. Right now we have actually three kids going out and 33 coming in, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we got fewer kids going out than Woodstock and stuff. Um, proof announced tuitions, which is which, a sheet, guys. Didn't yeah. Know. Right. So what we did is um, we set that, we had a, had a little bit of flexibility, a little, little leeway. Um, we set the tuition rate at our cost per kid out of our budget. Um, so the folks coming in are you know, the same as the taxpayers here. <clears throat> and finally, um, the Raven Collaborative Agreement, which I see is enclosed in here, and yeah. that is just... What we just talked about. Right. Yeah. Are there any questions for Lane about any of this um, that's on the consent, consent agenda? Um, it's mostly pretty routine stuff. So um, let's um, approve the consent agenda as a whole. Do I have a motion to approve all these five items? So moved. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, next, we have um, various reports, which will all be part of um, sort of the year-end report um, that's in the Herald and, and submitted for town um, town approval for town <coughs> viewing. Um, we've got Lane's superintendent report. Is there anything else you want to add or say about your report? Um, just a, a couple of a quick things. So the the reports typically are the annual reports that we do. Um, but uh, just kind of in terms of superintendent updates, the board policy revamp, that work is ongoing right now. Um, at the last kind of meeting where, where we met, the pre-planning meeting, it sounds like the board is able to attend to it in March, and I'll have it ready prior to that so folks can do a good read-through. We'll have all those policies um, updated um, together in one packet. Um, after that, it's going to be a long process because then I have to take what the updated policies are and create something that we don't have for most of them, and that's the actual protocols the school uses to carry them out. And so that'll, that'll be a bit of a long process. Um, the strategic plan piece that, that we spoke of is in progress. Um, actually, um, we took a look together with the cabinet. Um, we've mapped out the next three years for um, the foundational knowledge and science. We'll be doing that. Um, for the three main areas of the strategic plan um, um, over the course of the remainder of this year and then the summer. And then what should happen if, if the board is, is willing um, is in the fall, in the September meeting, is to present, you know, do that as the presentation of the overall strategic plan and how it ties in because that is pretty much the kickoff just prior to budget season and the budget should tie into what that strategic plan is so everything comes together and makes sense for folks. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and then the last piece was the board elections, um, the two positions. As far as I know, we still don't have any takers, Linda? No, but the ad goes in this week. You'll so, see it in the paper. Um, so that's the an ad, big announcement is that, you know, we did put a, we're putting an ad in the paper just to see if uh, we can drum up some interest. Um, and that's for a Randolph position and a Braintree position. And that's kind of it for my kind of updates. Um, in your packet is the letter from me, or from us, um, that, that will be as part of that um, sort of packet of letters uh, between principals, superintendent, and myself. Um, if there's anything you want changed, please email me. I, I, it was part of our uh, agenda packet, so you do have an email version. Um, if there's something you didn't like, let me know. Um, I sign it, but it's from all of us, really. Um, you'll also see the other um, principals' reports, etc. The financials for this month, Lane. Do you want to reflect on that at all? Yeah, they. Um, let me pull them up here. There's only kind of one kind of one note on there. So usually, what I do, um, I've kind of talked about this before, is um, kind of rule of thumb. We're about halfway through the year, so you know, if everything's linear, you expect about half of the lines. Um, what was put into each line to be spent. 
Um, typically, if it's you know outside of you know the 40 to 60 percent range at this point in time, I'm I'm asking Robin questions about those lines and what's going on. Um, things are good. Um, the only thing that I wanted to point out because it is a quirk. This is on the revenue page. So on the revenue page, if you go down from the top, that 27708 um, that's the current income coming in from the after school program. Um, so, you know, we will expect that to be probably around 60000 by the end of the year. That was one of the reasons, when, you know, we were in the budget discussions. We talked about, um, you know, it'd be nice to take the next step, the final step in terms of the preschool program, getting it so it's full day free for four-year-olds. One of the reasons not to, given that jump in the health care costs, was because what we have in place, if we maintain it, it is generating offsetting revenue, um, which is important. And then the other one. It's hard to find. Um, last page um, says expenditures at the top. It's the second block um, under transportation. It's L. And if you go down, it says unallowed special education. Mm -hmm. And if you go over, it's negative 21,965. Mm -hmm. um, what that is, and because this is an anomaly, it will also tell you something about the cost of special education. Um, we get reimbursed from the state um, for special education costs if they go above a certain amount. Um, these are costs for a child that, that we um, were transporting. Um, it's probably the most expensive child in the state. Um, and what ended up happening is when they redid the IEP at the end of uh, last year, is as part of the accommodations, they forgot to put in transportation. So they picked up on it pretty quickly, but because and, and fixed it, but because it wasn't in the wasn't in the IEP, the state refuses to reimburse for it, even though it was a state place student, and you know, so it's a, it's it's a big deal. Um, and so I've talked with uh, the special education department. Um, some of it is is potentially just being overworked, and they went into the actual software system, had them. Um, put a little pop-up that comes up if they have a student <laughs> that typically has transportation, the pop-up comes in and reminds them to take yeah. a peek. Um, but that was, they picked that up in less than less than three weeks, so that gives you an idea. Um, wow. That's only a partial reimbursement. Yeah. It gives you an idea of the expense sometimes of, of, mm -hmm. of, and the severity of the needs of some of these students that we work with. Um, so that's the only real anomaly in there. Everything else is, is pretty good. Some of the expenses in terms of um, Transportation, repairing the vehicles is a little higher than we would expect, um, but it's due partially to my fault. Um, the second year here, we bought two new buses, two additional buses, um, to transport the students from Rochester and the students from Chelsea, all the school choice kids um, that decided that they wanted to go. We didn't replace the two oldest buses that year, um, and so those ones are in the, the point where I'll be coming in to ask about. You know, get a little tap in the reserve fund for a little bit of money to replace two or three of the buses. Mm. Um, I have a question. Under maintenance, how come the contract and services are so far out of whack and the budget in your section J, line three? Oh, give me a second. It takes me a minute to orient myself. I can tell you in general, but I want to look, look specifically. So J, line three. And this is on the expenditure side, yeah. so they're over. Um, so a lot of this, we are still cleaning up messes that shouldn't be there from the previous facilities director. Um, and my guess is I have to go to Robin to confirm it, um, but one of the new ones now was whether or not you know it, there are chlorinating systems at both of the small schools. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't needed to be in operation based on the testing, but because when those wells were put in, part of the permit specified that there would be a chlorination system up and running, mm -hmm. we have to get them up and running. They have not been run since they've been put in. 
which is why we were unaware of it. You know, we were doing the testing and under my tenure here the way that we were supposed to and there was nothing being triggered that said we had to use it. Mm -hmm. um, but when they came in and they did the audit and did the walk around with us when we were looking at some of the water issues, they said, oh no, that's in the permit, you have to have it up and running. So that's an unexpected expense um, that would come out of the contract and services. But there are a lot of things like that that we are still finding um, that pop up. We talked last year about the fact that they did a lot of the plumbing in-house. Right. Um, and so, you know, $300,000 worth of water heaters and, and, and hot water tanks that had been put in because they were misplumbed had to be replaced um, to be able to provide um, the services. It's one of the reasons that we, we got our own HVAC person we hired right. on board was because going out to, to contractors to do the work that needed to be done was going to be too expensive. And just logistically, with formatting, how come on the expenditures it starts with an E for instruction so we don't see what's above that? There's no information leading up to it? Um, I think that's more, I'd have to ask Robin about her formatting. Um, sometimes, and again, I'm taking a guess. Yeah, I think it's here. This is ABCD. The, the revenue summary? was ABCD. That's revenue, but this is an expense. This is expense. She's asking why. Go to the summary the, page. But the, the very first page. But the ABCD EF follows. The revenue is ABCD, and then expenditures is EFG to P. Mm -hmm. That's awkward. <laughs> yes. one, uh, one of the things, and I, I am not <laughs> sure, <laughs> but uh, if I were putting my money on it in Vegas without asking <laughs> Robin. Um, they're trying to been trying to move to a single system um, for both data collection and finance. And lots of times what these lines are called and how they're labeled is defined by what it's called and labeled in the software system so that it can match up the, the, the cells. <coughs> My guess is it may have to be based on that, on, that, on how the state's organized it. When you get your policies um, from me, the revamp board policies, um, one of the suggestions was making sure that you use the number and lettering system that the state board uses. So your, the numbering may not make sense, but the reason I'm doing it is because it's following um, the policies that the state board recommends or, or expects. That way somebody who looks at ours, oh yeah, this is 2.36, can go to the, 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 the website and, and look at their similar policy and see if you know, we're up in compliance the way that we're supposed to be. So some of it's driven by that. So I can't say 100% for sure, but that's my guess. Or it could just be the way that Robin chose. Actually, do you see the summary page? Do you see? Yeah, one more. But it doesn't. It's oh, still yeah. A B C D E F G H I. Go yeah. right down the line, and yeah. then you start an entire expenditure page. But the revenues the don't have the A B C D. They don't. Next yeah. to it, but yeah. they are yeah. following. Yeah. The so I'll, I'll ask the question. I have an answer for folks. Just, yeah, it's a good question. It would make it easy to follow if the, if the <laughs> revenue state had A B C D. And those of you that haven't read these before, in terms of revenue, if it's a negative number, it means yeah. you're actually in the positive. Mm -hmm. They like to make things confusing that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, numbering system. And time for our board evaluation. Yeah. We treated everyone with dignity and respect. We sought a diversity of viewpoints. And the meeting proceeded mostly the way it was supposed to. I think there was a there was some more time spent on things that perhaps weren't allocated in the timeline, but overall we're at you know, we're we're within, you know, a half an hour. Twenty so, minutes actually. Exactly. <laughs> but within a half an we hour. We sped it up a little at the end there. Um, which it, historically isn't a very bad, is not a bad outcome. We're not, it's not midnight. If it were midnight, we would be getting a one for that. <laughs> <laughs> Before midnight. <laughs> if, if it was after 10, we'd still be getting a one for that. <laughs> and we'd have to own it. Um, so otherwise, I think we... I think we did all right. Uh, we did focus on the work of the board. We had a, you know, it, it can be difficult at times to focus on, uh, to not get sidetracked onto other agendas that aren't our own, but I believe we back to where we needed to be. Thank you for doing that. Um, 
we will need to you know, determine um, the validity of Cat Burns' request. Um, do we want to talk about that right now? Um, the, the totality there in the pink folder there, you know, folks are welcome to look if they want copies of all of it. It's not all the emails. They were, you know, typically with a conversation um, with Kat, there were 15 follow-up emails. Linda can attest to that, or 15 follow -up phone calls. Um, but all the pertinent emails are in there. Um, there were two investigations that I did during the time, too. There's, there are parts and pieces there. Um, there were accusations made um, against staff members that turned out not to be true, and there was also a lot of, probably shouldn't be saying this as we're in the executive session, but. Right. So, is, is, so it sounds to me like um, we should, to do due diligence, we should review whatever's in the file. Um, do we have uh, any documentation of what transpired at the select board meeting in Braintree? Okay. I, I just have, I have the minutes. Yeah. I have the minutes on my phone. Do you? Here, Were they, yeah. Was there actually any detail no, in not that? Really. No. Yeah. Okay, so I, I mean, that's maybe a question. No, it was, it's, it's no, it's Holly. It's Holly. Take those. <laughs> no, I was just wondering, you know, we, do we, we and the other thing I, I think that's pertinent is perhaps if we can find out whether there was a bus stop there <clears> and <throat> if there was, when. But even if there was, I think at the end of the day, the decision is about whether it's safe or not, and that's the yeah, decision. Yeah, whether it's safe now. So regardless of whether there was one, I don't think that's matters. I think we, we have to People decide if he did his due diligence in determining that it was a safe or not safe environment for the it bus to be on. It could have been a van, that. too. It may not have been a bus. That yeah. was the only other thing I was People thinking. People can also have made terrible decisions in the past. Right. Have it to could have been not safe and it was happening, but, but to often me... Do you have confirmation on the, the your conversations with the select board in the road people? I think it's. I think I typed up notes from it. Okay. Oh, because she was saying the opposite of what you were saying. Yeah, no, they, they physically came in, um, Megan and... Um, Yes. Uh, yep. It's they came in together, it's sat it's in it's my it's office in the afternoon, and we talked about it. There is the email that I actually sent to them inviting them in. Um, basically, the email, you'll see it in there. It's basically saying, you know, it's kind of joking around with them a little bit, was uh, basically saying, you know, um, you know, Kat has been, been, been pursuing this, and she's saying that the, the select board is willing to, you know, make changes to the road up there to make this happen. I said, I haven't, it might be better for us to talk in person, but I, I said, you realize, you know, there'd be some significant changes. There's tree cutting, there's, you know, adding to the road up there, there's this, there's that. So you just make sure you know what you might be committing yourself with before, before you do. So we should, we should talk. And that's what kind of triggered that meeting. So I think um, to do due diligence, this will be available in Lane's office. Um, People should take the time between, between now and the next meeting um, and review, read through what there is, um, and do any other further research so that we have, can make a, you know, an informed decision anyway. I mean, I think really the policies say that you are responsible for this decision. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, policy-wise, it seems fairly clear-cut, you know? Can I have a clarifying question? This affects one family. That's the piece I was. We've never sure heard what. from the other, gotten the name of who that other family is. Okay. I've never heard from them. So, um, the the thing that the board does have the power to do under your policy governance, um, you know, it's it's not something that you should do regularly. But let's say that you do this review and you find that you are in complete disagreement with me. Um, even though it's in my bailiwick, um, what you could do is a vote of support or a vote of non-support um, on the superintendent's decision. Um, that's a possibility too, um, if, you, if, if you felt so moved, you know, if you don't feel that we did our due diligence and whatnot. Uh, so I think, you know, everyone should review the policies that pertain to this matter and um, let's discuss it next month um, so that everyone's aware of what has transpired um, so that we're not mm -hmm. swayed by different conflicting mm -hmm reports of what happened. The other thing that I didn't want to bring up was Wes Gibbs was here. He was the bus coordinator afterwards. Mm -hmm. He probably would have a little insight if there was another stop up there. Yeah, I mean, right. I've worked at Brainerd School for a long time. I don't remember that there were it was. Yeah. The Dana Wes twins, I don't think they ever rode the bus. They're out yeah. past Rolling Rock, but I don't know for well, sure. Jeff, 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 Jeff said when he checked, the, the date, number of years he gave me was 30. Yeah. So, so back 30 years. Wes would definitely know. Yeah. yeah. 
And then Has our, our, bus stop up? our, our so folks that went back to 2001, they said no. Um, our memory went back. They said no, they've never been. So anyway, let's, let's revisit this next month and let's be prepared to make a decision. So just um, logistically, is there follow-up with um, the concerned parent to say that that's the process? Do we just notify her that the review is happening over the course of the next month with a final determination? Okay, I just think out of fairness I, I for that we should communication. Do that. Yeah. So, so that's something that will come out of Lane's office or? Something I don't know. Should I do that? Or yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. I'll through be able to through find the, her yeah, address. To, to yeah. Linden, to or, yeah. I'll get it to yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that tomorrow. Um, okay. So, um, how often are the bus routes every year? He, he, he looks reevaluated. He like, he um, he revamped so. them last year. Yeah. He did like uh, two weeks of trials. He was trying to make sure that no kids sat on a bus for more than 30 minutes, and he achieved it um, when he set up the new routes. Um, but he spent two weeks kind of testing out different things. We were communicating back and forth with the families, and then he put those new routes in. But it didn't change what was going on up there. Yeah, um, yeah he's been, he's, he's top notch. He really is. Mm -hmm. So I go to work at like 6.30 in the morning, and I see kids getting on the bus in Roxbury and they at go like 6.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then... And then if you drive down the road at 4.30 in the afternoon, they're getting off the bus at 4.30. I'm like, who would vote to send their kid to school at 6.30 and let them come home at 4.30? Like, who would do that? You don't That's totally unrelated to this. When you said the, bus, the kid rides with the bus more than 30 <laughs> minutes? He was trying to get it to 30. It was either in 30 or 30. They certainly do. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. my son gets on the bus at 7, yeah. and he gets at school at 10 of 8. Johnny's 6.45. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a long time. But yeah. that, that was his goal. Yeah, yeah. Definitely so that's, that's a good hour by my house too. It's a noble yeah. 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 It's, course, it's been that way forever. Right. Yeah. That's just because we had a forty-five minute bus ride. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. the, the other, you know, it's, of course, it's 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 actually fairly costly, but you know, you, throw, you can always throw another bus in there. Yeah, I don't think we need to do that because yeah. the buses aren't full as well, they are now. So. Some of the discussion goes back to the fact that now that it's one district. You have students that live who are Randolph students that live closer to Brookfield, and you know, and the, the way that the towns kind of wind around mm -hmm. each other, you know, is, is potentially. I'm not offering that to anybody, but if people ask, you know, I, I consider it when they do. I've got one that, that asked about it. I, I live, I live a mile away from this school, but yet I got to ride this many minutes to get to that school, and 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 especially like some like the bus my son drive, rides. It comes down West Street and goes up through East Braintree. Mm -hmm. When it actually passes some of the kids from the other, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's ever a thought to try to yeah. save some mileage, but it would yeah. move kids from school to school, though. Yeah, and I don't know the logistics because the 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 because of the drop offs, the elementary start at different times, um, and so that kind of controls a little bit about the buses and the timings and whatnot. But, um, that that's, we're opening up a whole other can of worms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's always, it's always yeah. worth it. That's not for the boards. No, <laughs> no, it's not our purview at all. So um, we actually now have executive session.